Well, all right, if you've got a Bible with you, uh, Revelation 2 is where we will be this morning. If uh, not, we'll have all the verses here on the screens, and you can just follow along there. Um, while you're finding that in your Bible, a uh, quick announcement. This coming Tuesday, we're starting a, a weekly men's breakfast and Bible, scu- Bible study. It's going to be every Tuesday at 6 a.m. at uh, Jackie's Kitchen off of Mangum. So, guys, we'd love to have you there. It's going to be informal. You don't have to sign up. Just show up. You don't have to be a member or anything like that. I'm all a so if you got uh, teenage guys, uh, bring them along. It'll be a great time for us guys just to hang out, uh, eat some greasy, delicious breakfast together, and uh, open God's Word and see what it has for us. So 6 o'clock a.m. this coming Tuesday, Jackie's Kitchen, guys, be there. So Revelation chapter 2. Um, have you ever been somewhere where you knew you didn't belong? All right, you were somewhere and you could look around and you just know, you're like, man, I stand out like a sore thumb. Uh, I remember feeling this way uh, several years back. If you didn't know, I'm a huge fan of the University of South Carolina Gamecocks. It's a uh, miserable and unfortunate existence as a Gamecocks fan. They never win anything. Um, But I was born a Gamecock, so I can't really do anything about it. That's where my allegiance lies. Uh, So back in 2011, it was week two of the college football season, and uh, South Carolina was playing Georgia, which is a pretty intense rivalry. And that year, the game was at Georgia. It was at their place. So uh, the week of the game, my buddy calls me. He's like, hey, I've got uh, an extra ticket. Do you want to go to the South Carolina-Georgia game? And I'm like, heck yes, I want to go. I am there. So we drive down to Athens, we pull up into town, he's got, you know, the Gamecock flags flying on his truck, we're decked out in our Gamecock gear, and I'll tell you, the people in Athens weren't too happy that we pull up into town like that, right? We're just sitting there minding our own business, tailgating before the game, and people are walking by like, hey man, I hope you choke on your cheeseburger and die. It's like, man, that's, that's kind of rude, that's kind of intense, And then we get into the game itself, and inside the game it's even worse. Because, you see, our tickets were not in the section where all of the away fans kind of congregate and sit together. Our our seats were in a section where we were just surrounded by Georgia fans. And, of course, anytime good happens, anytime something good happens for the Gamecocks, like we're going crazy, we're getting into it, we're standing up, we're shouting, we're high-fiving each other, and every time we do... I mean, people are throwing their popcorn at us. People are cursing at us. They're just saying all kinds of terrible, mean things. See, being a Gamecock fan there, we stood out like sore thumbs. And because of that, we had to endure some some criticism and some ridicule and some mocking because of that. Now, here's what's interesting. As I think back on that experience... We could have chosen to still go to the game, and we could have chosen to still root for the Gamecocks in our hearts, right? But we could have chosen just to blend in, right? We could have decided just to wear some neutral clothes instead of wearing our Gamecocks clothes. We could have decided not to cheer out loud any time we scored. We could have decided just to kind of cheer inside of our hearts, and if we would have done that, we would have blended in. And we wouldn't have to have people yelling at us and cursing at us and throwing things at us. Right? But, but we know that's not how you do college football, is it? Right? You've got to be dedicated. You've got to put up with it. You've got to represent your team. But see, any time you go to a college football game, especially if you're going to an away game against a team that is a big rivalry of your team, you've got to make a decision. You've got to decide, am I going to choose just to kind of blend in? Am I going to choose to stay quiet? Am I going to choose to keep my allegiance just kind of deep inside my heart? Or am I going to rep my team till the very end no matter what it causes me to go through? Now here's the reality. Uh, I think for the church here in our culture today, we are almost faced with that same kind of choice. Right? Because we all realize, don't we, that over the last several decades, our culture has just been shifting and changing at a rapid, rapid pace. Right? That, that, that as culture changes, as Christians, what we believe and what we think and what we value don't necessarily line up anymore with what culture at large thinks and believes and values. 
And so as a result of that, there are times where, as Christians, where our beliefs and our values don't line up with culture's beliefs and values, and as a result, we end up being mocked, and we end up being ridiculed, and we end up having to endure all of these things. And so whenever that happens, there's this temptation that we face as followers of Jesus. And the temptation is, hey, are we going to choose to compromise on what we think and what we believe in order to just kind of blend in so we don't have to endure ridicule? Or are we going to stand firm in our faith, stand firm in our beliefs, stand firm in our values, even if it causes us to stand out and be ridiculed? Now, as the church in America, this is a little bit of a new challenge for us today, because again, those of you, especially if you're a little bit older, you know, growing up, you didn't really have to um, fight through and think through this question. Uh, because several decades ago, you know, the values and the beliefs of Christianity, those were the values and the beliefs that were accepted in society at large here in America. But, but now as society and culture has changed, again, our values don't necessarily line up to the values of culture. And so we're faced with that temptation. Are we going to choose to compromise what we think and we believe to, to blend in, or are we going to hold fast to our faith? Now, while this may be a new question for us here in America in 2021, th- this isn't a new question for the followers of Jesus at all. Right, right? That's a question that for most of the Christians who have lived throughout the world, throughout most of history, this is a question that they have had to ask. And this is a question that the people in the church of the ancient city of Pergamum were having to ask. This was the challenge they were going through. So this is what Jesus writes to the church in Pergamum. Revelation chapter 2, verse 12, this is what it says. Jesus says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Pergamum. This is the message from the one with the sharp two-edged sword. I know you live in the city where Satan has its throne, yet you have remained loyal to me. You refused to deny me even when Antipas, your, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there in Satan's city. But I do have a few complaints against you. You tolerate some among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. In a similar way, you have some Nicolaitans among you who have followed the same teaching. Repent of your sin, or I will come suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what He is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven. I will give to each of you a white stone, and on that stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. So to understand what's going on here and really what this means for us today, we first need to understand that Pergamum in the first and second century was an incredibly religious city. Right? We've talked about so far in this series how the Greco-Roman world during this time period, it was a very kind of open polytheistic culture, meaning you could worship whatever gods you wanted to worship as long as you worshiped Caesar, the emperor, as the god who reigned above all of the other gods. And so Pergamum, it was actually the first city in the Roman Empire that built a temple dedicated to Caesar, to the emperor. It was the first city that had a temple that you could go to to specifically worship the emperor. And so Pergamum kind of sat as the center of the imperial cult, right? It was the center of the worship of the Roman Empire. But in addition to the temple to Caesar, they had temples to all sorts of other gods. They had a a temple to Zeus, Uh, they had a temple to the god of healing. They had a temple to Dionysus, who was the god of fertility, the god of wine, and the god of religious ecstasy all in one. All right, so there's kids in the room, so I'm not going to tell you the kind of worship that would take place at the temple of Dionysus, but you can imagine, right, being the god of wine, the god of um, fertility, and the god of religious ecstasy, right? The parties at the temple of Dionysus were wild, right? Let's just leave it there. All right, so if you were living in Pergamum in the first century, and you wanted to be basically an accepted member of society, if you wanted to fit in to your culture, then you had to do two things. 
You had to be open to worshiping all sorts of gods, but you had to worship Caesar above all those gods. And two, you had to have little to no moral conviction, especially as it pertained to your sexuality. And so that's kind of the, the culture of Pergamum. It was this incredibly spiritually dark place, so much so that Jesus says that it's a city where Satan has its, his throne. Right? That's how spiritually dark Pergamum was in the first century. Jesus says that Satan reigns in that city. And so in the middle of that spiritually dark city, you have this little church filled with followers of Jesus. Now, before Jesus corrects them of the things that they need to change and repent of and turn around, He, he, he first commends them for what they're doing well. So look back at verse 13. Jesus says, I know you live in the city where Satan has his throne, yet you have remained loyal to me. You refuse to deny me even when Antipas, my faithful witness was martyred among you. So church history tells us that, that this man Antipas, he was one of the leaders of the church in Pergamum, and because he refused to bow down and worship Caesar as God, the Roman Empire came and arrested him, and to put him to death, they, they created, they made this hollow brass bull, they put him inside of it, and then they lit a fire from underneath the bull to essentially slowly roast him alive. So this church in Pergamum, they have watched one of their leaders, one of their pastors, be tortured to death for his faith. And Jesus says, even though you have seen that happen, you still haven't denied me. You still claim my name. You are still following me. Jesus is commending them. He's saying, you have been willing to give your life for me. He's saying, you are a church that is willing to die for me. But then the question becomes, are they going to be a church that is willing to live for Jesus? Right? Yeah, they're willing to die for Him, but are they going to be willing to live for Him? And to be honest, sometimes it may be more difficult to live for Jesus than it would be to die for Him, wouldn't it? Uh, like, I believe the majority of us in this room, if it came down to it, I believe that we would be willing to give our lives for Christ. I think we would do that. I think if, God forbid, somebody walked in this morning and they had a bomb strapped to their chest and they said, hey, you've got five minutes and this thing's going off, I will let you leave if you deny Jesus. If that happened, well, actually if that happened, we are in Texas after all, so half of you would probably pull out your concealed weapons and take them out. But if that wasn't an option, if that happened, I think the majority of us would say, hey, Whatever happens, happens. We're not denying Christ. But I really do believe most of us would have that kind of faith. We would give our lives for Jesus. We would die for Christ. But again, at least for me, maybe not for you, for me, it's a lot harder to live for Him. It's a lot harder in the day-to-day -day mundane struggle of life to remain faithful. That's a lot harder for me than it would be to die for Jesus. And that was the same for this church. Jesus says, hey, you are willing to die for me. You are willing to follow me to death. But the question is, are you going to be willing to live for me? So this is where Jesus rebukes them in verse 14. He says, but I have a few complaints against you. You tolerate some among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. So Jesus here, he's referring back to this story of this guy named Balaam from the Old Testament. So back in the Old Testament, there is this king of an enemy nation of Israel named Balak. I know, I know Balak and Balaam, it's confusing and hard to follow, but track with me. Balak was the king of this enemy nation, and he wanted to go to battle against the Israelites. He wanted to wipe the Israelites out. So Balak calls this guy named Balaam. And Balak says, hey Balaam, if you come and if you will curse the Israelites for us so that we can then go and defeat them, we'll make you rich. We'll give you whatever we want. So Balaam comes along. He tries to curse the Israelites, but God prevents him from doing it. God won't allow him to curse the Israelites. And every time Balaam opens his mouth to curse the people of God, he inadvertently blesses them instead. 
So Balaam goes back to Balak and says, hey man, I can't do it. I can't curse the Israelites. I can't curse the people of God. He basically says, listen, we can't destroy them from the outside. We've tried to curse them. We've tried to destroy them from the outside, but it's not working. So then Balaam tells Balak, he says, we've got another idea. Since we can't destroy them from the outside, let's try to destroy them from the inside. And Balaam says, here's the idea. Here's what you should do. Get some of your women to go into their camp and to seduce the men and cause them to commit adultery. And then after you've gotten your women to go seduce the men, then get those same women to teach those same men to worship the Moabite gods. And if you can get the people of Israel to compromise in both of those areas, then we've got them. Then they're done and we can go in and defeat them. So that's the story of Balaam and Balak from the Old Testament. And Jesus is saying here in Revelation that there are people here in this church at Pergamum who are doing the same thing. Right? He said the church has stood strong from the attacks from the outside. That even when Antipas was murdered, they are still not denying their faith. They've stood strong to the attacks from the outside. But Jesus is saying that now there are people attacking them from the inside. That there are people who have infiltrated the church who are trying to get them to compromise. Who are trying to get them to say, hey, let's compromise just a little bit. And if we're willing to compromise just a little bit, then we can blend in. Then we can fit in to culture and things will go a lot easier for us. Right, as in the example I mentioned earlier, they're basically saying, hey, when you go to that away football game, you don't have to wear the visiting team shirt. You don't have to stand and cheer and do all that. You can just quietly root for them in your heart. No one really has to know. Right, that's what these people were coming in and telling the church at Pergamum to do. They're saying, hey, when, when it's time to bow down and worship Caesar and, and proclaim that Caesar is Lord, then it's okay, just do it. Just bow down. Just say the words. You know in your heart it's not true. You know in your heart Jesus is still Lord. Just compromise a little bit. Right? The people are coming into the church and they're saying, listen, it's fine if you want to go down to the temple of Dionysus on the weekend and you want to sleep with the temple prostitutes. That's just who we are. That's just what we do in Pergamum. It's part of our culture. It's part of our identity as a society. If you just compromise a little bit, then we can blend in. We won't have to stand out. We all know that we can just worship Jesus privately in our hearts. And that's enough. That's what the people in this church are saying. But again, it doesn't matter what the people are saying. It matters what Jesus says. So look again at verse 16, what Jesus says about this. He says, repent of your sin. Basically, repent of this mindset that we can just kind of keep our faith private inside of our hearts and no one else has to know and we can just compromise a little bit and at the end of the day, it's okay. Jesus says, repent of your sin or I will come suddenly and fight against you. Listen, a fight against Jesus is a fight we will lose every time. Amen? Right? I don't want Jesus coming and fighting against me. But he says here, he is very clear that when his people are, are compromising what they believe so they can blend in with the culture that surrounds them, he is not pleased. Now again, what does this have to do with us? And again, more and more and more, we are living in a culture that is so rapidly changing that more and more it doesn't reflect what we see, the truth of the Bible. Right? And by the way, just as a total aside, those of you who are senior adults, that's why I am so proud of you and I am so grateful for you that months and months and months ago, as a church, you voted and you said, hey, we want to adopt our surrounding community. Basically, we want to do whatever it takes to reach the Garden Oaks community because this community is filled with young people. Right? And those of you who are a generation or two or three above mine, 
Again, when you grow up, what you believed as a Christian and what you valued as a Christian was basically what the culture believed and valued. But you see, for the generations coming up behind mine, it is completely different. Right? For the first time in American history, people are mocked, people are ridiculed, people are called all sorts of their things because they believe God's Word is the basis of all truth. Right? And, and so for my kids and the generations coming up after them, it is going to be incredibly difficult for them to faithfully walk with and follow Jesus. And so for you senior adults, that's why I'm so grateful to you that, that you say, man, it is so hard today to be a Christian, so we need to do whatever we can do to reach the next generation, to come alongside of them, to love them, to pray for them, to support them. It is incredibly hard for them to faithfully walk with Jesus today. But again, we all realize that, right? We all understand that, that our culture is rapidly shifting and changing. So the question is, how do we respond to it? What is our response? And really the way I see it, there's three responses. Two of them do not honor God, and one of them does. The, the first way we respond to a changing culture is exactly the response that the people of Pergamum had. It's to blend in. It's to say, well, times have changed culture has changed, so let's kind of set aside some of our beliefs, some of our values, so that we can just kind of blend in, so we don't have to worry about standing out and being ridiculed. That is a response that a lot of people have today, but again, Jesus makes it clear here, that's not the response that he wants his people to have. The second response that, that some people have is where they essentially remove themselves from culture. I think this is a response that many of us would be most tempted to have. But again, it's not a response that honors God. It's a response that looks at the culture that says, man, things change. Things aren't like they used to be when I grow, grew up. So we're tempted to kind of wring our fist at the culture, rail against how terrible culture is, and say, man, I'm removing myself from culture. I'm only going to surround myself with people who are like me, who look like me, who think like me, who believe like me, who talk like me, who vote like me. And so I'm just going to create this little comfortable bubble that I live in, and I'm just going to live inside of my holy huddle all the time. Right? It's a response that says we need to completely remove ourselves from culture instead of engaging the culture for Christ. But, but notice here, Jesus doesn't tell the church at Pergamum to do that, does he? Right? Jesus says, you are living in a city where Satan has his throne. But Jesus never once says to leave that city, does he? He never says to pack up and move. He actually commends them for remaining there in that godless culture. And it's interesting. Jesus doesn't say, hey, I know it's hard to be a Christian in Pergamum. I know the values of Pergamum aren't your values. I know it's difficult. So, hey, why don't you guys pack up? Why don't you move to Jerusalem? Because Jerusalem's a much more uh, conservative city. There's a lot more Christians in Jerusalem. If you pack up and go to Jerusalem, you'll be a lot more comfortable there. But Jesus never says that, does he? He never gives them that choice. He never says it's okay to just completely remove yourself from culture. So that's not what we're called to do either. So what's the biblical response? How do we biblically, as the church and as followers of Jesus, respond when, when culture is ever rapidly changing in front of us? I think what the Bible calls us to do is to be an outpost for the kingdom of heaven. Right? That's the biblical response. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be an outpost for the kingdom of heaven. Or as Dr. Tony Evans says, the church is to be an embassy for the kingdom of God on foreign soil. Right? Think about that analogy. Think about what an embassy is and what it does. Right, right? If you go to Moscow, Russia, you can go to the American embassy in Moscow. The American embassy in Moscow, it, it represents America in the middle of a nation that is hostile to American values. It represents American interests in a nation that is anti-American. But the embassy there on Russian soil serves to represent America. And so the people who work and who live in that embassy in Russia, they don't go to work every day and say, hey guys, 
You know, since we're in Russia, let's just adopt Russian values. Let's adopt Russian culture. Let's, let's forget our American identity while we are here in Russia. They don't do that because that's not their job, is it? Their job is to represent America on foreign soil. Their job is to show what America is like, even though they are a long, long, long way from home. So for us as Christians, what the Bible teaches us is that our ultimate allegiance, our ultimate citizenship is to the kingdom of heaven. Now you've got to understand that. You've got to realize that, that biblically speaking, if you're a follower of Jesus, before you're an American citizen, before you're a Mexican citizen, before you're a Canadian citizen, before you're a citizen of any other nation on earth, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're first and foremost a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And so as the church, we are representatives of a foreign kingdom while we are here standing on foreign soil. And so, of course, living here in a distant land on foreign soil, uh, of course, our, our culture may be hostile to the things we believe, to the values that, that we hold dear. But we are not called to blend in. We are not called to hide in the shadows. We are called to stand out and say, hey, there is another kingdom. There is a greater kingdom. There is a greater way. That's what we're called to be. We're called to be an outpost for the kingdom of heaven here on foreign soil. So how do we do that real quick as we wrap up? What does it practically look like to be an outpost for the kingdom of heaven? How is the church, do we practically live as an embassy for the kingdom of heaven living here on foreign soil? To do that, we've got to stand on two things. To do that faithfully, we stand on truth and we stand on love. If that's what we are going to be, if we are going to be an outpost for the kingdom of God here in our changing culture, we always stand on truth and we always stand on love. We can never compromise either of those. So first, we can never compromise truth. Look at verse 12 at how Jesus introduces himself. He says, write this letter to the church in Pergamum. This is the message from the one with the sharp two-edged sword. In this culture and in this day, a sword represented ultimate authority. A sword was the symbol of authority. And Jesus says, I'm the one with the sword. I'm the one with all authority. And remember back in Revelation 1, John said when he saw Jesus, he saw the sword coming out of where? It's coming out of Jesus' mouth. Jesus says, saying that his word carries all authority. Right? What he is saying is that for his church, for his people, his word, the Bible, is our ultimate authority. Right? This book is our ultimate and final and complete standard of truth. So here's what this means for us. As the people of God, we can never interpret the Bible through the lens of our culture. Right? That's the temptation, but we can never interpret the Bible through the lens of our culture. Instead, we must always interpret our culture through the lens of the Bible. Right? So when it comes to, to questions and, and issues of things like sexuality and marriage and gender and those things, we don't first say, hey, what does culture think? We don't say, what, what are people on Instagram saying about that? Well, what does our culture think and believe? That's not our first question. Our first question is, what does God's Word say? What does the Bible say? We use the Bible as the lens by which we interpret culture. Right? When it comes to politics, whether it's issues like immigration or abortion or whatever issue you want to fill in the blank with. Listen, we don't first say, well, let me see what Sean Hannity is saying. Or let me see what Rachel Maddow is saying. Or let me see what Ben Shapiro is saying. You know, what are they saying on Fox News or on CNN? That's not our first question. Our first question is, what does God say? What does God's Word say? How does God tell me to interact with this issue? Right? We can never interpret the Bible through the lens of our culture. We always interpret our culture through the lens of the Bible. 
Jesus is saying here clearly that that for His church, we must stand on the truth of His Word, which is found in the Bible. The Word of God is our highest and our greatest authority. It is our source of truth, and we can never compromise on that. But then at the same time, as the people of God, we can never compromise on love. We never compromise on truth, but we can also never compromise on on love. After all, the Bible says that God is love. And if you read the Gospels, you see through the ministry of Jesus over and over and over again, He never compromised truth, and He also never compromised love. Right? Don't let people tell you that you got to pick one or the other. That's not true. That's a lie. We can hang on to truth, and we can hang on to love. A perfect example of this is Jesus in John 8. In John 8, it's this famous story of this woman who was caught in adultery. And so the religious leaders who caught her in adultery, they, they, they bring her into the town square and they're getting ready to put her to death because that's what the religious law required. And so Jesus stumbles onto the scene. And the religious leaders say, Jesus, what do you think we should do with this woman who was clearly caught in adultery? She's guilty, there's no question about it. What did Jesus say? He says, let he who is without sin be the one to throw the first stone. And it says, one by one, all of these self-righteous men begin to drop their rocks and walk away. When the crowd left, Jesus walks over to this woman. He bends down and he reaches his hand out to her. And he says, I don't condemn you. He says, I don't condemn you. Jesus shows this woman incredible love that no one else was willing to. He shows her incredible grace and incredible mercy. Jesus doesn't for a second compromise on showing love. But then he keeps going, and and this is the part of the story that, that we don't like as much today because after Jesus reaches down and says, I don't condemn you, he says something else. He says, now go and sin no more. He doesn't compromise on truth either. He says, I don't condemn you. I love you. And what you were doing was wrong, so knock it off. Don't do it anymore. He doesn't compromise on either, does he? He stands fully, completely on the ground of truth, and he also stands fully and completely on the ground of love. Jesus always stands on truth and love. And so if we as the church today in this rapidly changing culture, if we are going to be the church that God has called us to be, we always have to do the same. We stand firmly on truth and we stand firmly on love. We stand firmly on the truth and authority of God's word and we love everybody regardless of how different they are from us the same way that Jesus loved everybody regardless of how different they were from him. And when we do that, we will be the true church. Now, here's the reality. It's going to be hard. It's not going to be easy to do that. And Jesus knows that. He knows it wouldn't be easy for Pergamum, and he knows that it won't be easy for us. So he ends this with this incredible encouragement. He says, anyone with ears, in verse 17, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Listen to this. To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven. And I will give to each of you a white stone, and on that stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. Jesus says, first for his church, standing on truth and love in a culture that doesn't accept them. It will be difficult, it will be challenging, it will be tough, but he first says that he will give manna to them that is hidden in heaven. What's he talking about? He's talking about the people of Israel when they were wandering through the desert in the Old Testament. When they're hungry and wandering through the desert, God provides manna for them, for them to eat so that they could be sustained, so that they could be filled up. Here's what Jesus is saying there. He's saying when you are my people living in a culture that does not accept you, it's going to be tough, it's going to be difficult, you're going to feel alone, you're not going to feel accepted, but I will sustain you. I will give you the strength you need to keep on going, to keep walking faithfully 
with me. He says, I will give you manna hidden in heaven. And then he says, I will give to each of you a white stone. Now, the historical meaning of this white stone is a little bit ambiguous, but what most historians and what most scholars say is that after an athletic event, the winners of the athletic event would be given a white stone. And they say that the white stone was basically your admission, it was your ticket into the winner's circle. Literally, the white stone was the way that you got into the after party to celebrate your victory. Here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying there's a party that is coming. Right Right now it may be difficult. Right now it may be tough. Right now, walking faithfully with Jesus, it may take every ounce of courage that we possibly have, but stay strong because Jesus says, there is a party that is coming. And in the kingdom of heaven, there is going to be a party like this world has never seen before. And through His death, In His resurrection, He has already given us the ticket to freely get in. Let me pray for us.